Thank you, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. Let me make sure I got my uh, got my mic on. It's all good. Okay. Hey. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Ed, for the invitation and staff for the invitation. It's great to be back here. I was here five years ago talking about Mars rovers. Maybe some of you were there. Any Planetary Society members here tonight? Yes. Woo! Let's change the world. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a new project that uh, I finished up uh, recently and put together into this uh, fun book. And we're going to take a trip into the future, the not too distant future. Uh, but nonetheless, the future. And I want to start it off with, um, you can't hear me, okay. Is that better? Good. A little better? A little higher even? What do you think? Yes. It's what they gave me. <laughs> we'll work with it. I can project my voice. Okay. Um, I want to start out actually with a, uh, a short film that you can uh, watch on the internet. And I will uh, play it here and try to get it going into full screen mode. Here we go. Maybe we got the lights down a little bit too. For all its material advantages, the sedentary life has left us edgy, unfulfilled. Even after 400 generations in villages and cities, we haven't forgotten. The open road still softly calls, like a nearly forgotten song of childhood. <laughs> we invest far off places with a certain Romance. The appeal, I suspect, has been meticulously crafted by natural selection as an essential element in our survival. Long summers, mild winters, rich harvests, plentiful game. None of them lasts forever. Your own life, or your bands, or even your species might be owed to a restless few drawn by a craving they can hardly articulate or understand to undiscovered lands and new worlds. Pretty spectacular little film by uh, Eric Wernquist, and a great um, a great start, a uh, great way to start thinking about <clears throat> traveling into the future. Um, every single place in that little film is a real place in our solar system. All the data that you saw, the pictures and all that's based on real data. It's not made up. 
what, uh, what Eric and his fellow filmmakers did was they put people there. They put people into those real environments and imagined what it would be like in the future. And that's what I spent some time doing recently as well, imagining a possible future for us. Yes, maybe they can turn my mic up too. Thank you. Imagining a possible future for us in, uh, I'm gonna get feedback, okay. Imagining a possible future for us in, uh, in space as not just robotic probes, not just people going as scientists, but as tourists, as adventure travelers, as, as individuals, as families, as couples, uh, going out and studying, our, uh, exploring our solar system, visiting our solar system, just like we can visit our planet today. And 100 years ago, if You've been sitting around with somebody and they said, hey, you know, this crazy contraption that these, uh, these made out of bicycle wheels and wings that these guys in North Carolina just came up with. In 100 years, you're going to be able to take one of those, maybe two of them, three of them, and go anywhere on Earth. And they'd look at you and say, you're insane. Why would I get in that kind of crazy contraption? Incredibly risky, incredibly expensive. Uh, and lo and behold, that has happened, right? And, you know, it's first it started out as very dangerous, very risky, very expensive, the realm of the rich and the super rich, people who had lots of expendable income who could try crazy things. And I can stand here and say, you know what, in 100 years or maybe 200 years, you'll be able to take some crazy rocket-borne contraption, kind of like the ones that billionaires are playing with today maybe two of them, maybe three of them, and go anywhere in the solar system. No, you're crazy. You're absolutely insane. Well, maybe I am insane, OK? Maybe it's 50 years. Maybe it's 100. Maybe it's 200. Maybe it's 500. But I'm really an optimist, and I think it's inevitable, and it's coming, OK? I think tourism is a great business model for Earth. And there's no reason why it will not be the same great business model for space, deep space. So. My presumption is that it's a couple hundred years from now. And you're sitting around with your spouse. It's like, hey, uh, you want to go to the moon for the weekend? <laughs> I don't know. What are we going to do there? I'll pick up a guidebook. You know. <laughs> hey, let's take the kids to Mars for the summer. Oh, wow, that sounds crazy. What are we going to do there? It can't be much to do. No, no, there's a bunch. I saw this guidebook. So this is that guidebook. So you've decided to take that long-awaited trip off planet, right? You have to start preparing for it. You've got to start thinking about what are you going to do and how do you have to prepare, right? So what is there to see? Are you interested in uh, nature travel, hiking, caving? Are you interested in going to somewhere where you can see some extreme sports? Are you interested in the history of space exploration, retracing the steps of some of the famous Explorers, human and robotic? Are you interested in great dining and entertainment experiences across the solar system? Right? All of these are going to be options because just like the tourist industry on Earth had to develop the infrastructure so that when you get there, there's something to do, that there's a way to get there, that there's a way to get around, that there's equipment uh, for you there, the tourism industry in space will be developing that same kind of infrastructure. And it'll be for regular folks and for adventure kind of folks. You know, if you want to go, uh, hike Mount Everest, you can do that today. You need proper equipment and proper training. If you want to go scuba diving to some deep Caribbean reef, you can do that. You need proper training, you need proper equipment, okay? You want to go to the surface of Venus or the moon for the weekend, you're going to be able to do that. You're going to need proper equipment and proper training. I think that's coming as well. So you're going to have to worry about things like changes in gravity that we don't really have to deal with too much here on the Earth, right? Huge temperature swings, high and low temperatures, Things like acid rain or dust in that environment, radiation, other kinds of natural hazards, long travel times, right? Um, one of the assumptions that I'm making in this projected future is that uh, no magic is required. I don't have to invent warp drive. We don't need transporters, right? We're not going to take lightsabers when we get there, okay? Just reasonable personal opinion, extrapolation of technology, propulsion technology, other kinds of materials technology, et cetera, into the future, based on what we've seen happen and the rate of change of technological advance in the last century. So I think it's reasonable. 
Maybe you'll call me a crazy optimist at the end. Okay? But, so let's start. Let's just take a walk through some of these possible destinations and we'll start on the moon. What are some of the things that you can do on the moon? Well, if you're into history, you can tour historic landing sites. There's ice at the poles of the moon. It'll be the basis for much of the uh, sustainability of uh, people living on the moon, first in uh, uh, colonies and then in longer term tourist facilities. Uh, great hiking, some just spectacular uh, mountain peaks and valleys. Um, there are lava tubes on the moon that can be enclosed to create uh, shirt sleeve environments with low gravity. So think about the theme park opportunities there. Think about the low gravity sports opportunities. You golfers, right, might want to really think about <laughs> drive for show. Uh, there are places where uh, the sun never rises at the poles, and there are places where the sun never sets. Great spots for resorts uh, on the lunar surface. And of course, unique lunar cuisine opportunities, right? With every terroir comes a specific kind of cuisine. And so they'll be like, oh, these Brussels sprouts, they're far side Brussels sprouts, aren't they? Yeah, they kind of taste that a little bit. I think those things are coming. And you, we can already predict, uh, I, I guess I would say this for all these possible destinations, we can already predict now, based on 60 years of exploring the solar system with humans out to the moon and robotics all the way out to the edge of the solar system, we can predict now where the cool tourist hotspots are going to be. Where are the interplanetary national parks going to be? Right? Where are the most amazing opportunities for a romantic getaway going to be in the solar system? I think we know that, right? And we can, we can build a, a future based on that. So some of the places to go on the moon, if you want to see like the historic landing sites and go look at Neil and Buzz's footsteps, probably be protected, some kind of a rope or something like that, or a dome uh, around these uh, truly historic uh, human landing sites. There'll be places if, if you really want to get away from it all and you want to leave the Earth, but you don't want to go too far away, but you want to get as far away from everybody at home as you can, you go exactly to the middle of the far side of the moon. That's about as far as you can get away from it all. And of course, uh, without the earth and the sky, beautiful uh, dark skies, uh, and uh, it'll be lots of radio astronomers probably hanging around there, but also just some spectacular views. There will be research stations, there'll be scientific research going on on these places, but tourist opportunities as well. So you can retrace the steps of some of the Apollo astronauts, go to places that they weren't able to go, and see some of those amazing early um, uh, exploration sites. Visit lava tubes, like this is a lava tube that's uh, top has, uh, has collapsed uh, in the Aristarchus region of the moon, but there are plenty of lava tubes on the moon that are still intact, and they'll be uh, very interesting places to explore scientifically as well as for uh, habitability, affording some radiation protection, and you can seal them off and create that shirt sleeve environment. And just some spectacular hiking. This is part of the um, central peak of the crater uh, Copernicus. And um, I envision that there's a beautiful trail that you can take up here. Um, we've, uh, astronomers from the Earth have detected the mineral olivine uh, in these uh, peaks. And so this is, uh, you can take a, a hike called Peridot Peak Hike. And there's some beautiful gem quality Peridot minerals up here. And please leave them, leave them as you saw them, okay? <laughs> Pack out your trash, okay? Uh, but you're up at uh, 18,000 feet uh, elevation, but it's only been a sixth of a G to get you there, so you're probably not that tired. Okay, maybe the moon's not your thing. Maybe you want a place with a little bit more atmosphere. Maybe you want a place with a lot more atmosphere. <laughs> Venus, what about getting to Venus? That's a tough one, right? Technology has got to solve some problems, but there are places that you can go in Venus that are very, actually very Earth-like, high up in the atmosphere. Uh, the concept of an air hotel, a dirigible, if you will, a space qualified, uh, high tech qualified air hotel is one that I think will uh, come to play in places like Venus as well as the giant planets. Getting down to the surface though, I think that's some real adventure travel. Uh, we, need some, we need some advances in thermal control, we need some advances in materials and spacesuits, but it's the same gravity uh, as the Earth. Uh, there's some pretty spectacular uh, geology there. Um, the atmosphere is much thicker, so it's possible to don a, a pair of wings and fly much more easily than it is on the Earth, so you can get much more lift. Or you can take a tour 
down onto the surface with a specially piloted uh, vehicle. But I think there's going to be a lot to see there, uh, and it's going to be a, an extreme environment, uh, but I think extreme technology can solve that problem. Lots of places to visit, places where uh, uh, space probes have been before. The Russians landing a bunch of probes there in the 70s, flying uh, balloons along with French colleagues through the atmosphere, but also just some pretty spectacular um, uh, terrain on the surface. Um, here's some examples of some of the Russian views uh, from the surface with some of their sort of uh, almost uh, WPA kind of spacecraft, giant rivets and bolts and huge um, steel uh, bodies to protect from that 90 times the Earth's atmospheric pressure, 850 degrees Fahrenheit temperature on the surface. You need to descend through clouds of sulfuric acid to get to the surface. Good times, right? <laughs> It's a technological problem. It's an engineering problem. It's a solvable problem. It does not require magic or some crazy advance in technology. I think the opportunities will be there. But also opportunities to float up at layers in the atmosphere that are very Earth-like in terms of temperature and pressure and above the, the sulfuric uh, acid layers. So um, I'm envisioning a whole series of these air hotels that have popped up, uh, drifting along the equator or going around certain uh, geologically interesting areas, and some are the oldest ones, great for first-timers who want to go, or adventure travelers, uh, lots of great bars and pubs. Uh, couples and families will have options, too, uh, just like in, in the tourism industry on the Earth. And the sites uh, available to view will include some spectacular volcanic terrain, enormous rift valleys, Grand Canyon-like terrains on Venus, uh, similar to, in some ways to the terrains on the Earth. Now, we don't have absolute evidence 100% confirmation today that Venus is volcanically active, but there's no reason it shouldn't be. It's basically the same planet as the Earth, as an intrinsic planet, same kind of internal heat sources. There's most likely active uh, volcanism, and so the volcanologists out there, as well as the amateur volcano lovers, should have a great time uh, once those, uh, those volcanoes are mapped out. So I, I think that that's going to be pretty, pretty fun as well. Maybe you want to go a little faster. Maybe you're not just want to uh, uh, laze around the clouds, but you want to zip around on the fastest planet in the solar system, Mercury. Right? Mercury is intermediate in size between the Earth uh, and the Moon. And for a long time, it was just th thought of as sort of just the Moon, basically a little bit bigger. But there's no, there's no atmosphere there. It turns out it's a fundamentally different kind of planet, very high density, very big core, lots of uncertainty about how it got that way and, and where it is. So it'll be the focus of a lot of scientific study. It will also be the focus of a lot of extreme sports. Uh, if you want to set the land speed record in the solar system, you do it from Mercury, because you're going the fastest of anybody else around the sun. Right? You're only taking 88 days to orbit around the sun. So a uh, colony on one of the big uh, craters there uh, kind of makes sense. Equatorial location, relatively easy to get to the surface. And then uh, uh, lots of interest in uh, going fast in cars or other kind of uh, speedy vehicles. Um, there are places on Mercury that can produce, that, that have uh, unique astronomical phenomena. Because the planet's orbit is not circular, it's elliptical. Because it's not locked into a one-to-one -one orbit around the sun, like, uh, like the moon is locked around uh, the Earth. Because it takes three Mercury years for the planet to spin twice on its axis, it's in a resonance. Uh, there are places where you can watch the sun set and then the next day it rises again, and then the next day it sets again. And then you wait till you come around to the next uh, sunrise. There are places where the sun does that loop in the sky directly overhead and spends extra time at certain longitudes directly overhead. And the ground is super, super hot, almost as hot as Venus. So it's the hottest solid surface you can be on in the solar system without having the help of an atmosphere. So maybe those kinds of things are interesting to you. Or strangely enough, there's ice on this crazy hot world at the poles. Just like on the moon, there are places where the sun never rises, where intrinsic ice from the surface is leaking up and is never evaporated, where a comet happens to crash there over the history of the solar system, and it's never evaporated. And so those are going to be the places where the people who live and play on Mercury get their fundamental uh, resource. And ice, water, is going to be like gold in the solar system, more valuable than gold, right? Ice, you can, you can melt it and drink it. You can split it apart and breathe the oxygen. You can split it apart, use the oxygen and the hydrogen for rocket fuel. You can use the, the water or the ice as a shield against radiation. 
right? All kinds of uh, resources you can pull out of that, and it's an absolutely essential thing for human survival. If you can find it there, much better than having to bring it with you from the Earth. And it's there, even on crazy hot Mercury. <clears throat> so uh, you can visit the ice caves. You can hang out at the Colorus Colony. You want to go to Double Sunrise Resort and watch a very romantic uh, double sunrise. The rooms are all lined up at the right longitude, so you can see. It's beautiful, astronomically. It takes a while. You get an easy chair, get a nice drink, relax. But it's a beautiful thing. Or maybe you want to go the other way. Instead of hot and fast, you want to start getting colder and go farther out and take the kids on that summer vacation to Mars. Uh, why not? I think Mars will be next, besides the moon, the next most popular place uh, that people go uh, for, for tourism. There'll be lots and lots to do there. Multiple colonies in a variety of locations, <clears throat> some just because they're easy to land on, others because they have interesting uh, geology or other attributes to them. There'll be uh, orbital hotel-like research stations and communication satellite relay, relay stations. I'm imagining three of them, but there could be many more. It's only a couple hundred years from now. They'll still keep growing. Those kinds of stations, like other places in the solar system, will primarily be for research or communications, but they'll offer opportunities for tourists who want to hang out and see what the crew is doing, or sort of eco-tourists who want to help out in some way. I think those opportunities will be out there a lot. Spectacular volcanoes and canyons to hike, lots of places where water once existed and lots of it still exists as ice uh, in the subsurface. So especially at the higher latitudes, the ice is very close to the ground. That's going to be a resource for people uh, to tap into. The snows at the poles, uh, you want to try to go skiing on dry ice instead of water ice. Completely different technology, different set of skis, different physics, uh, but it can be done. And why not? Uh, you wait for the right time of year, and you can ski on water ice and then transition to dry ice. That's kind of cool, too. Why not do it all? There's the history side of it, you know, the early uh, NASA landers and rovers and other countries getting into the mix, other companies getting into the mix with some historic first landings. And then um, things like sporting events. This is the, I don't know, 565th Winter Olympics uh, being held on Mars. Why not? Why not? Um, food, music, and culture, right? Wherever tourists go, there are opportunities for food, food, music, and culture. It will not be any different. We will be the same species a couple hundred years from now that we are today, and we will still love food, music, and culture. Uh, and those will be attractions uh, at places like Mars and elsewhere. So lots of potential places to go for historians or people who want to go adventure traveling, hiking the tallest uh, mountains in the solar system, Olympus Mons, the other giant volcanoes in Tharsis, uh, traveling, uh, here we go, volcanoes in Tharsis, like this one, uh, traveling into the deepest canyons uh, in the solar system, hiking or roving around, visiting the polar caps. And then as you saw in that movie, uh, totally realistic to imagine that advances in technology will allow us to build space elevators. And that's going to really change the, ga the game in terms of getting off the surface of the Earth and getting onto the surface of other planets. That's, an, that's one where we don't have the technology to build materials today of the right strength to be able to handle the stresses associated with this. But you know, on paper, it can be done if XYZ gets invented, if problem ABC gets solved. It doesn't require miracles of physics. It does require significant investment in technology and advances. Uh, but they're, I think they're realizable. We can imagine them, they're realizable. Hiking around in places that uh, Mars rovers have visited in the past. I love this picture because I'm, in, I'm involved in the, the Opportunity mission that took this picture from Victoria Crater. And, you know, we imagined what could we put in here for scale. Uh, it's very hard to, uh, to get a sense of scale on Mars because there's no houses or tumbleweeds or anything like that. Uh, but if you put picture, uh, people into the picture, and now you get a sense of uh, what an uh, absolutely spectacular hiking adventure this would be there, or watching some of the famous blue sunsets of Mars where the, the physics is kind of backwards from the Earth. You know, the Earth has a thick atmosphere, and when the sun is high, scattering all that blue light, and the sky is blue, and as the sun sets, the blue is completely scattered away, so we get these beautiful red sunsets like we had this evening here uh, over the Hollywood Hills. Uh, but on Mars, the atmosphere is really thin and full of dust, and so that thin atmosphere doesn't scatter the blue light. The dust scatters the red light, makes the sky red in the daytime, and as the sun sets, 
that dust scatters the blue light forward at us, and so we get these beautiful blue sunsets on Mars. And so these might be a bunch of hikers or it might be a bunch of poets. Don't know. Uh, but it would be a pretty spectacular scene. You can't forget the little moons, Phobos and Deimos, uh, that orbit uh, Mars. And they're, they're small, but they're logical places to stop. You've gone all that way to get to Mars, right? You're probably going to stop on Phobos or Deimos on the way down or on the way back up as a way station. Because uh, you've come all that way, you've got to stop and refuel, refuel or switch spacecraft from a cruise mode to get between Earth and Mars to a surface mode to get down to the surface. And they're little lumpy potatoes, but um, they're interesting places to explore. Um, one of them, Deimos, orbits uh, way out here from, from Mars. The other, Phobos, is much closer in. So on Phobos, Mars is this gigantic looming object in the sky. Uh, on Deimos, you're orbiting at almost the same rate that Mars is spinning. So you spend a long time like, basically looking at the same place of Mars as it slowly drifts past you. So two very different kinds of experiences um, observing the planet uh, above you. And certainly can easily envision uh, bases or, or colonies or places, at least way stations, where uh, these ships will stop on the way to or from the surface. Uh, major city on, on Phobos. Uh, kind of fun skimming tours through the grooves around Stickney Crater, which is a large crater. There's a great, a great restaurant um, <laughs> that I recommend, Cucina Panorama. Um, it's a little bit of southwestern flair with the Phobos touch, you know. Um, and they mine a lot of carbon on Phobos. It's a carbonaceous uh, uh, asteroid. They get a lot of carbon used in this, the steel making industry uh, on Mars and on Phobos, uh, from Phobos itself. Uh, and this, uh, this restaurant has a full panoramic window views, uh, floor to ceiling, uh, just Mars in the sky as you're passing over. And everything is just, uh, just beautiful. Or you can take a, a tour on some of those mines and see how they extract the carbon uh, and some water out of that material. There's a, a few 5% or so water in that Phobos material. And that's enough uh, to extract uh, out, of the, um, uh, out of the surface. Or at Deimos, uh, there's a, a beautiful ring space station uh, that you can pull into where they simulate uh, 1G because of the spin rate. There's about 1,000 people that they can fit there. Um, Deimos has this smooth surface. And so sort of strange historically, it developed into this kind of smooth jazz feel on Deimos. And for whatever reason, the best jazz festival in the solar system happens on Deimos every year. Um, you got to get your tickets ahead of time. The station completely fills up. Uh, it's a unique experience because some instruments actually respond differently to gravity. Uh, and so depending on where in the ring they're having the concert, you can have different gravity levels, different responses, slightly different frequencies, and there's some pretty unique kind of uh, uh, innovative jazz uh, getting created out there. That powdery surface is also uh, a, a, a potential to do some really kind of crazy uh, adventure sports. I uh, don't recommend this unless you're trained in it, but these specially tailored individual rockets can actually fly through that powder, which in some places is a, a few meters deep. And they're kind of using the same philosophy as um, like a fan boat in a Florida swamp. You know, you're sitting in the back, and the guy in front's driving, and you're like, oh my god, we're going to crash. We're gonna... No, you're just flying through this powder. And, uh, the courses are pretty well set. The rocks have been generally removed. So, uh, but again, I, I really recommend proper training, proper equipment. So, uh, but you can go watch at least, which is kind of fun. So lots of cool things going on there. Or you want to still go, go, go out to look at some different objects. Uh, between the Earth and Mars, there's an enormous number of near-Earth asteroids. This is a, a, a map of just some of them, of their orbits. And here's the inner planets, the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter. And so these are all these uh, objects that come buzzing by the Earth and the other planets occasionally. And uh, a small number of them uh, have uh, uh, sprouted colonies and developments and some tourist opportunities, uh, places where you can go and see, uh, for example, some of them have uh, uh, some volatiles in them, like water ice and other volatiles. And there are mining communities there you can visit. Uh, some of them are very active, bringing some of those volatiles, as well as metals, uh, back into the Earth-Moon environment or out uh, to Mars or other places. Again, the philosophy and the economics being uh, much easier to, if you can find the natural resources out there, extract them from those environments to use in those environments instead of having to bring them up uh, from the Earth. Or maybe uh, you want, just want to go get some sun. Maybe you literally want to get some sun. Uh, now, this is uh, 
a couple of other forms of adventure travel. Um, so how many people saw the eclipse uh, last August, right? Pretty spectacular event. Um, how many people saw the last couple of transits of Venus across the sun, which was uh, eight, seven, eight years ago, right? And I remember uh, that last one and, and you know, the, these so-called learned astronomers telling us uh, that you're never going to see another one of these in your lifetime. It's going to be 100 years or something like that. Well, horse hockey, okay? <laughs> you can see a transit of Venus anytime you want if you're in the right place, okay? <laughs> You can see a solar eclipse, total solar eclipse, anytime you want if you're in the right place. Okay? It is possible to manufacture astronomical events. Okay? If you get on the right ship, book it at the right time with the right crew and the right destination, hey, we're going to go spend a week in the moon's shadow. And there's a research crew, they're studying the corona, and they just want a bunch of time with new instruments. But we can, you know, we're going to take 20, 30 tourists along. If you're willing to crunch some data, do some citizen science on the side, uh, you can get pretty spectacular views. You want to go see a transit of Venus, a transit of Mercury, transits of Earth from other places, you can do all those things. It's a whole list of astronomical events that are very rare for those of us stuck here on the surface of the Earth, maybe at certain longitudes and latitudes, but that can be manufactured through the tourist industry. I think that's going to be pretty cool. Um, speaking of the sun, uh, there is an opportunity. Again, I'm not advocating you do this, OK? <laughs> but there are some cruise companies that will fly you through a solar coronal loop, OK? Um, there, Ben, you've, you've read about the accidents, I know. <laughs> Uh, the technology is really pushing the edge of thermal shielding and radiation shielding, okay? Uh, these are dynamic events, okay? This, this one is, you know, happens to be a dozen times the size of the Earth, so they're big, but they're dynamic. They change on very rapid time scales. The sun is extremely active and, and rapidly changing star. But if you really want to thrill and you're really pumped up by the adrenaline rush of diving in a ship through one of these things, the view is unbelievable. I mean, I've heard the view is unbelievable, but very risky. But there are, you know, if you sign the forms and the lawyers make you sign the forms, it's, it still could be a lot of fun. Okay, so you want to get a little further from it. You want to get out into the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Longer travel times, okay? I think the travel times to these destinations right now, like to get to Mars, the fastest ships that NASA sends to Mars robotically, six months or so, nine months one way. Okay, I think advances in propulsion technology will bring those numbers down. Okay. I think also the economics will make it such that if you want to get to Mars in a couple of weeks or less, you can, but you're going to pay a first class ticket to do it. You want to get to Mars in six months? No problem. They were doing that hundreds of years ago. We can do that. That's your coach ticket. That's steerage. Okay. <laughs> But if you want to get there fast, you're going to pay more. That's the economics of tourism. We all know how that works. It's going to work in space as well. So weeks to months to get out into the main belt between uh, Mars and Jupiter. And there'll be at least three destinations to start with because we know a lot about these places, Ceres and Vesta, two of the largest asteroids uh, in the main belt. And Psyche, uh, which is a 250 kilometer <coughs> wide sphere of metal, the largest metallic asteroid in the solar system. Caught a lot of interest uh, from the asteroid miners, of course, not just iron and nickel, but lots of precious metals that are extremely rare uh, in the Earth environment. So there's opportunities to visit those places, stations or small cities on Vesta, Ceres, and Psyche. Vesta is a, uh, a silicate asteroid with lots of interesting silicate and iron uh, minerals. It's had a volcanic history. Uh, it was m once a much larger object that had a, a complex geology and lots of mining of silicates done there to use throughout the solar system. Ceres, one of the most ice-rich uh, asteroids out there, lots of, of, of water ice and other ices and salts on the surface of Ceres. We've known that since the robotic probes. Uh, so places to mine a bunch of different materials to use, again, as resources for the locals and others in the space environment without having to bring that stuff from the Earth. And then the metal mines <coughs> on Psyche, which uh, were uh, making an enormous amount of money, especially in super rare Earth element uh, precious metals. Uh, of course, that whole market crashed 
uh, about 150 years from now, um, <laughs> when, uh, when people figured out how to capture very small, metal-rich near-Earth asteroids and completely uh, mine those objects. So there was this cadre of super-rich people that made a ton of money on, on Psyche, and they cra their, their economy crashed. And so they've turned all of those mansions, low-G mansions, into resorts and spas. It's high end, but it could be pretty nice. Some of the views are pretty spectacular. Uh, the views of, of Ceres and the ice mines, places like Akator Crater, uh, where um, uh, ice and salt have been discovered. And then some of these beautiful metallic frozen uh, crater spires uh, on, uh, on Psyche, where the geology of a metal world was, was first revealed in the 2020s. OK, maybe that's still not enough. Maybe you really want to go even further out. Maybe you've got a little more time. Um, maybe um, you know, you're between jobs or looking for work uh, in the tourism industry uh, or have decided to take a year or two sabbatical and you want to go out to Jupiter or Great Red Spot even further. Okay? The Great Red Spot, of course, is an enormous cyclonic storm system three times the size uh, of the Earth, uh, spectacular views. Uh, Jupiter also has just amazing aurora, right? People who love the northern lights in Alaska or Iceland, uh, totally blown away on an enormously different scale, orders of magnitude, more intense auroral activity, uh, and you can view it uh, in person. You could go impact hunting. This is a cool tourist opportunity. Jupiter is hit by small comets and asteroids all the time. Some of them you can predict coming in, like the comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 back in 1994, knew about a year in advance that that was going to hit Jupiter. Others are rather sudden. But they all produce these spectacular explosions in the atmosphere of Jupiter. So again, get in the right ship, the right cruise line, the right time, allocate enough uh, time for your, your ship to get there, and you can fly right into uh, the aftermath, the immediate aftermath of uh, an uh, enormous uh, impact explosion. And then just like on Venus, I think there'll be air hotels floating at different levels of that uh, spectacular atmosphere. Of course, the Great Red Spot is, uh, this is not a painting, this is reality. Uh, and uh, uh, some of the most beautiful and uh, just evocative landscapes, or uh, cloudscapes uh, in the solar system. You saw that, that wonderful the, uh, clip from the movie where, um, where they've imagined a ship that has an enormous bay window, and you're just going to hang out. Just going to hang out and watch Jupiter for a while. What a, what a buzz that would be, right? Uh, impact hunting, following along with uh, small chunks of asteroids and comets and watching them light up the skies. Uh, not too close. You don't want to get too close, but your crew will be careful. And you've signed the forms, so it's OK. <laughs> or hanging around in a balloon or an air hotel at levels of the atmosphere where uh, you could literally walk out onto the deck of your room, the patio or balcony of your room, in shirt sleeves with the proper breathing apparatus. Uh, but the temperature and pressure would be pretty much what, uh, what you grew up with. Um, Jupiter has these uh, spectacular moons like, uh, like Europa and uh, other moons around Jupiter. Uh, Europa has been and will continue to be a major focus of exploration. Uh, because it is uh, an ice-covered world with an enormous liquid water ocean under that ice, uh, two or three times the volume of the ocean uh, on the Earth. So ocean, oceanography on Europa is a, is a real field of scientific study. Um, the most volcanic world in the solar system is not the Earth. It's Io, Jupiter's moon Io, which is ripping itself inside out because of tidal forces. And then Ganymede and Callisto, also large moons. Ganymede is larger than the planet Mercury. I call it a planet. I, I think I'm crazy, right? I'm a crazy astronomer. Sorry, Ed. Uh, I think there's 35, 40, 50 planets in the solar system. I look at them as individuals, what they're like, what they've been through, how they've evolved with time. I don't so much care about where they are. I think about them as in, intrinsically what they are. Uh, Ganymede being larger than the planet Mercury has fascinating uh, geology and probably a slushy liquid water ocean under its surface uh, as well. But Europa is probably the, you know, the highlight, certainly is for astrobiologists, people looking for evidence of life outside of the Earth. There's an ocean, a liquid water ocean under that ice. It's in contact with a rocky mantle, just like the Earth's ocean is in contact with the rocky mantle. There are probably you know, hot plumes of, uh, of uh, magma or other uh, hot gases coming out of the interior, creating environments that we know on the Earth are conducive for life as we know it. So the search for those environments on Europa 
has really sort of already begun with the, the robotic missions now, but it'll be an intense search over the next centuries. Io, if you like volcanoes, a spectacular place to visit. There'll be stations, there'll be research stations at, at least uh, on these facilities. Uh, many of them uh, will follow the model that um, uh, many research uh, activities take here on our planet today. Uh, the ecotourism or citizen science tourism model where you, you want to come along and help you know, save the lemurs or count the ice cores or whatever. You want to go help uh, look for cellular detritus in some of the waters of, of Europa or map hot spots on the ocean floor of this planet-sized world. Uh, then you can join the research crew as a sort of a tourist and they'll give you lectures and tell you what's going on and you're helping to fund their scientific research, you and your family. And it's pretty spectacular places to go. Uh, uh, amazing geologic terrains. You saw the, the clip from the movie of people hiking across the surface with the amazing clouds of Jupiter in the background. Need some really good radiation safety technology, right? It's an incredibly harsh radiation environment. Um, I'm an optimist. I think technology can solve that problem. If it focuses on solving that problem, which it will if it becomes a business enterprise, just like on the Earth, technology focused on solving problems for businesses. Uh, the other moons, so Europa, the one I was just talking about, is the, the smallest one. Here's Ganymede, the largest one, Io and Callisto. And Io is the, the volcanically active one. Um, enormous numbers of uh, hundreds of active volcanoes at the same time going off. Uh, from large to small, fire fountaining these beautiful plumes, uh, taking these sort of ballistic trajectories like un unfolding umbrellas across the surface. Uh, hang out with a team of volcanologists and, and just enjoy the view. Uh, pretty spectacular uh, environment. Ganymede with its crazy racetracky surface, Callisto with its powdery, heavily impact cratered surfaces. There would be research going on in both those places as well. And if you're one of those people that just, you know, you got your solar system passport and you want to check off every, oh, yeah, bend to Ganymede. Yeah, oh, got to go to Callisto. Got it. Okay. Get those on your list too. Keep going out. Let's go out to Saturn. Saturn also has a, a collection of, of large moons, including uh, Titan, uh, the, the only moon in our solar system with a thick atmosphere, 50% uh, thicker than the, than the air in this room, uh, toxic to us, so you need the right breathing apparatus, but a thick atmosphere. A base on Titan as the focus of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, astrobiology study, as well as studying the early Earth, right? Titan is a, there's almost no oxygen in that environment. It's a very uh, reducing environment, lots of methane and other hydrocarbons, nitrogen, uh, and, um, that's kind of what the early Earth's atmosphere was like before life came along about two and a half billion years ago and injected all of this toxic gas into the atmosphere called oxygen, which was toxic to most of the life on Earth at that time, uh, but completely changed the atmosphere and the biology of our planet. Well, Titan hasn't done that. The chemistry is very slow. It's only 90 degrees above absolute zero on the surface. But at those temperatures and pressures, those hydrocarbons are liquid. So there are seas, there are rivers, there are lakes on the surface of Titan. They're just not made out of water. They're made out of hydrocarbon uh, liquids like ethane, and methane, propane. So you can go whitewater rafting on the surface of Titan. You can also look at Saturn's rings. I'll come back to that in a second. Multiple ways to get there. Uh, You've seen all these tourist brochures. I mean, it just the, the companies are trying to get you to sign up for these things, right? Go visit the seashores of Titan. Uh, go ice bouldering among the rings of Saturn. Lots of cool opportunities out there, right? Uh, here's a map from the Cassini mission, from the radar mapper of some of the large lakes and seas on Titan. Great places for research stations and initial bases. And the, the start of your, your um, rafting trip or other kind of adventure. Uh, you don't have to raft if you don't want to. You can hike. Uh, this is um, one of the places near, uh, it's a river of uh, hydrocarbon that's flowing out of one of the seas called Kraken Mari. And it's on my list of places to go because I want to hike over here and I want to stand under a propane waterfall. <laughs> Properly dressed. Like Venus, the Titan is one of those places where you can fly. You saw this in the film. That's totally reasonable and accurate physics. 
uh, thicker atmosphere than the Earth and much lower gravity. Combine those two things, strap on a pair of wings, jump. Why not? Let's do it. Great views of the rings of Saturn uh, from all of the moons uh, of the Saturn system, of course. And uh, look, one of the most uh, romantic places you can take your spouse, uh, get into one of the uh, floating restaurants inside the rings of Saturn, right? Great meal, first of all. Uh, plus, you're surrounded by a billion little diamonds sparkling in the sunshine. Some of them the size of ice cubes, some of them the size of houses. And you're just kind of co-orbiting with them, and they're gently bumping into each other once in a while. Uh, but it really, it just kind of gets you right there. Very, very romantic. Think about it, right? It's going to cost you a little more. You'll take a little more time, but isn't she, he worth it, right? Come on. Titan has an, uh, Saturn has another really interesting moon, many other interesting moons, but uh, among the most interesting is Enceladus. Enceladus is a tiny little moon. You could squeeze it in between Chicago and Boston. Uh, and yet, it has some of the most enigmatic and active uh, geology in the solar system with geysers of water and organic molecules spewing out of its surface, uh, discovered by the Cassini mission. Um, lots of opportunities for geyser hopping on the surface, citizen science opportunities for uh, analyzing the source of those geysers and figuring out what's going on underground. Even though it's a tiny little moon, there's not much gravity, not much internal heat, it's got the, all the ingredients for a habitable world. It's got liquid water, it's got organic molecules, it's got heat sources. And actually, that's all you need to make a world habitable for life as we know it. It doesn't mean it's inhabited, but it's habitable. And the number of places across the solar system that that satisfy those criteria is actually pretty small. It's less than a half a dozen. And so uh, lots of research going on, lots of interest uh, in, in this uh, kind of place. And you can, of course, do some Saturn watching there as well. You saw the clip from the film, uh, one of these uh, orbiting uh, ships passing through uh, the geysers, very similar to what the uh, Cassini spacecraft did, flew through these geysers. And that's how we first learned that there's organic molecules and water uh, among that material spewing out. So the research stations and the potential tourist opportunities will focus on those places where if there is a subsurface ocean or a large sea or liquid water somehow in contact with hotter rock underneath like we have on our own planet, uh, that this is the place where that water is coming out so we can directly sample it. Um, so there'll be opportunities like that. All right, so maybe you've got a lot of extra time. Maybe you're thinking of retiring and taking a one-way trip out to the outer solar system. Why not? Let's leave it all behind, right? Sell the house, buy the cruise tickets. Let's go to Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. You're talking about going deep, deep out into the solar system. Probably even with a first-class ticket, you're talking about years, years of travel time, which is why it's most likely a one-way trip. So you have to make some plans. You know, If you're of a certain age, you might not come back. They'll take care of that for you. You can add that into your package. It's, all, it's okay. Um, but getting out to those distances, right? Here's uh, you know, Jupiter and Saturn in here, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and a host of other uh, Pluto-like objects, Kuiper Belt objects that have only been uh, discovered since the 1990s. Uh, lots of comets out there that you could visit along the way. And some really cool uh, th sites to see out there. The, the geysers of Triton, you saw the, the cliff diving, I'll come back to that in a minute, on, uh, on Miranda. Um, skiing Pluto, right? Uh, discovered in 2015 that Pluto has these, these uh, mountains of water ice floating on plains of nitrogen ice and methane ice. And again, multiple skiing opportunities, multiple companies offering you different technologies and lots of fun. And, uh, and major uh, parks out there, interplanetary parks for, uh, for hiking and other kinds of winter fun. Just for scale, right? Neptune and Uranus, smaller than Ju uh, Jupiter and Saturn, but much larger than, than the Earth and the other terrestrial planets, and fundamentally different than Jupiter and Saturn uh, in that they are mostly made out of volatile ices instead of hydrogen and helium. Jupiter and Saturn, enormous gas balls, gas giants, Neptune, and Uranus, uh, commonly called ice giants among planetary scientists. Uh, another one of my favorite places that I can't wait to buy a ticket to go, um, 
an enormous cliff on Uranus's moon Miranda. Miranda, very small moon, very strange geology, enormous faults and, and uh, 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 jumbled up terrains. But one particular place uh, where there's a cliff that is 10 miles tall and sheer 90 degree slope and just put on a spacesuit and jump, right? And fall for 10 minutes, read a newspaper, whatever, right? <laughs> just fall and fall and fall and fall. And you know, your terminal velocity at the bottom is still pretty fast, so there's some cushions and other nets to catch you down there. Uh, they're actually talking about putting a bungee on this. So <laughs> fall for 10 minutes and then bounce up for 10 minutes. <laughs> pretty spectacular. Or maybe uh, geysers are your thing. You've seen a bunch of geysers, uh, of course, on the Earth. You've seen a bunch of volcanic eruptions on Io. You, may, you saw the geysers of Enceladus, and you really want to check out the nitrogen geysers of Triton, Neptune's large moon that's uh, also a volcanically active world. So lots of opportunities out there. There's also opportunities if you really want to leave the solar system, the first sort of generational uh, ships are being contemplated, tickets are, you know, investors are being sought, uh, places to visit now that we know that there are all these extrasolar planets out there. There's a system called TRAPPIST-1. It's only 40 light years from the Earth, it's basically right next door. And there's at least seven uh, terrestrial kind of planets, at least three of which are probably in the so-called habitable zone, maybe the Goldilocks zone. Uh, we don't know enough about them just yet, but there's still a lot of people who are willing to take a, a trip out there. Maybe they won't see the place, maybe their children, maybe not even their grandchildren will see the place, but there will be opportunities to really get away from it all. <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, um, I mean, I, I, would I really do want to go to the moon for the weekend. Um, I really would love to visit Mars or other places, but as a tourist, um, I want to come back. <laughs> Um, I want to come back to the Earth, uh, despite the fact that I, I study other planets. My favorite planet is the Earth. Um, I've lived here most of my life. <laughs> most of my friends are from here. Um, and it is, it is an oasis in space. And everything that we learn about how to live, how to get into space, how to live in space, how to sustain ourselves in space, on these other environments, these other planetary surfaces, these other planetary atmospheres, all of that information will make life on Earth better. All of it will remind us of the cocoon that we live in, will remind us of the limited resources that we have to deal with to get on with our lives. And uh, I'm a firm believer that uh, people who go to other places, experience other cultures, other environments, expand their minds. When they return, they're different people. And they bring a little bit of that knowledge, that experience, that culture back with them. Uh, and I think people will do that when they come back to the Earth as well. That uh, movie was the, narrated by uh, some, some clips by uh, Carl Sagan from uh, Pale Blue Dot. Uh, a couple of quotes that I really enjoyed. Uh, right, Everybody remembers Moby Dick. I'm tormented with an everlasting itch for things remote. I love to sail forbidden seas. Right now, these are forbidden seas to us, but they won't be. They won't be forever. I'm an optimist, and I really don't know if it's 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, or what, but we're heading out there. And as, as Sagan himself said, here we go, uh, you know, maybe it's a little early, maybe the time's not quite yet, but those other worlds promise untold opportunities and they beckon silently. They orbit the sun, waiting. And I don't know about you, but I can't wait to go. Thank you. What a great uh, visual journey into out there. Right, you you coming? Let's, let's go. I would go. All right. I would go. Uh, questions for Dr. Bell? Uh, up there. Um, yeah, your first hand. Uh -huh. yeah, uh, by the way, the graphics, that, that kind of 1950s, 60s style travel, out of space graphics were fabulous. Wanted to ask you, the one thing I noticed that you didn't have was the archaeological tours of the, of the planets. Um, 
<laughs> well, I told you I wasn't going to try to invent fake news. Um, you know, of course, if we discover some evidence of life off our planet, that will be a major focus of exploration and will be a major tourist destination wherever that or those places turn out to be. Uh, extrapolated the number of humans permanently based in these uh, various tourist places. Will it be in the hundreds of thousands or tens of millions? Have I predicted the number of, of humans to be in these environments? No, I have not. Um, it's really going to, I think, depend upon the, the pace uh, that these kinds of technological advances happen and the economics. Um, you know, for, for decades, airline travel was the realm of the super rich, and it took 100 years for it to become middle class opportunity. But space has been and frozen. What we're seeing in, um, in rocketry right now, today, in the past 10 years, is a dramatic decrease in the cost of getting to orbit because of a few certain technological advances that are, have been made and some vision. Um, extrapolate that into the future, and I, you know anything is possible. Hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people, it just depends upon if technology can keep up with our needs, if we can find those you know, resources that can be sustainable for us, if we can't go and trash those places, if we don't go and kill each other at those places. You know? I mean, you can get into the science fiction part of this real easily, because that makes a much better movie. Uh, but, uh, and, and we will, as I said in the beginning, we will be the same species. You know, there will need to be you know, cops and lawyers on Mars. It's good. Absolutely, absolutely, right? Um, I, I would love to believe, I, look, I'm a total, I'm a Roddenberry uh, fanboy, right? I would love to believe in that sort of utopian Star Trek future, and maybe centuries from now we will have, you know, evolved in some way to head in that direction. I'm certainly hopeful. Many centuries, many, many centuries, uh, but maybe not in the next one or two. Other questions? Yeah, in the white shirt. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, in going to Mars, the soonest it would take with normal uh, technology that we have today, six to nine months, and then you mentioned maybe getting there in a couple of weeks with a different type of propulsion. What type of propulsions are on the table right now? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm not an engineer. Um, and I didn't get into that in any detail in the book because I didn't want to open a can of worms and pretend to be an expert on something I'm not. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I probably know as much as you do about this if you read, you know, Popular Mechanics, Popular Science Magazine or whatever, and, and look at some of the different technologies that are being explored, ion drives, and there's nuclear technologies that are being explored. And I don't know which of those could pan out. I don't know what increases in efficiency are still waiting to be discovered in simple <coughs> chemical propulsion and nozzles, you know, I, I don't know. Um, and I, I didn't try to, I'm not trying to get into the, the weeds of the details because I don't know them. Um, so there, I guess there I'm... Are people working on it right now? There are, there are people in NASA and other space agencies working on advanced propulsion. Yeah. Not, I don't think it's anything at the levels that would, you know, instantly take an order of magnitude off of trip times. Mm -hmm. But then I'm saying this is a couple hundred years from now. And you let the, let the research advance, you keep funding these programs and keep <coughs> experimenting with new technologies. And, you know, a bunch of people were screwing around in the 40s and 50s at Bell, Bell Labs with these stupid little electronics that they called a transistor, you know. What possible use could that be? Okay, you've made a little chart, you made electrons move across this tiny, so who cares? Here we are, right? Um, I noticed you had uh, several different artists uh, credited in your presentation in addition to, of course, the filmmakers from the film. Um, could you talk a little bit about the inspiration process that you used going back and forth? Yeah, so, uh, somebody else brought up the, these great sort of travel posters. So, so, sort of the 30s travel poster era, you know, retro, some art deco, but all about futuristic stuff. And for whatever reason, there's been about a dozen artists, space artists, and there's a big space art community, as you may know. About a dozen of them, have, including some NASA folks, have decided to dive into that and make these beautiful posters. And so um, that was part of the inspiration. Actually, um, I wrote a, a 
couple of other books with this publisher, Sterling. And uh, I was talking with my editor, and she said, you know, we were sitting around looking at these posters. Have you seen them? I said, yeah, I love those posters. Is there some way we, we would love to put those in a book? It's like, I've had this idea for a travel guide for a long time. <sighs> so, and so in the back of the book, we've got like eight of them. We, you can tear them out and put them on your wall or whatever. But they're scattered throughout the book. And the, the NASA ones, you can uh, go, if you just Google NASA space art posters, you can get, download the super high res files for free and send them to your favorite Kinkos and they'll make you posters out of them. So, but, but there's a bunch of artists that have been doing that and I just, we're sort of just riding that wave of nostalgia for the future. Uh, in the back, with the gray shirt. Oh, hi. Um, uh, you think in the future when we develop the new semiconductor uh, alloy that will work in normal temperatures, you think there will still be a need for a space elevator? Well, I don't know. Um, but certainly, a space elevator saves a lot of the hassle of needing to propulsively get yourself off of a surface. So it's kind of a dream, but it's a technologically realizable dream with certain technological assumptions. Uh, and the <clears throat> the superconductor thing, that's really interesting because, you know, the, the precious metals industry right now, there's, electronics is a huge market for precious metals. And a lot of what's driving the choice of using certain metals, platinums and rhenums and all those things on the periodic table, a lot of it's economics in that, you know, we know where there's deposits of that stuff on the earth that are economically extractable. But you'd much rather use these other elements on the periodic table the physics tells you, use these other ones because you'll get much higher efficiency, much lower power, you can build them much smaller, whatever, but you can't find that stuff easily on the Earth. But you can find it all over the place on metallic asteroids, right? So if you suddenly create a market that doesn't exist for materials but the physics says that's the stuff you want to use, then engineers and inventors will go crazy with it, right? I think that's coming too. Uh, a lot of these ideas remind me a lot of uh, wilderness oh, yeah. and uh, I think about an industry there that like search and rescue. Mm -hmm. I think that'd be an inter interesting industry to see here. If, oh yeah, uh, people. Oh, there will absolutely be a search and rescue yeah. industry. <laughs> <laughs> look, like, look. Falling out of balloons, like, people falling out of your balloon. That's a good one. Uh, <laughs> you got to act fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. An one where you really could save someone. Like so, you're you're hiking on Phobos. Right? The gravity is, you know, one one hundredth, one five hundredth of the gravity on the Earth. And, you know, okay, you got your tether and you're going along, and, but it's like, oh, this is kind of boring. I think I'll just jump. <laughs> All of a sudden, <laughs> you've left orbit. <laughs> and your guide is like, oh, man. <laughs> we got we to gotta go get that guy. So my question is, uh, what other... <laughs> support industries that you haven't mentioned in your lecture do you foresee like that? Yeah, I mean, medical, certainly health, um, but also all of the traditional service, uh, hospitality, where's Caitlin, hospitality industry, right? My niece is in the hospitality industry. All that stuff, entertainment, uh, plus uh, service and repair, uh, you know, mechanics out there, engineers fixing things, uh, refueling stations, transportation, everything that supports the tourist industry here has to be out there for that business model to hold. Uh, and that's why I think it's, it's not going to be instant. It's going to take a long time to put that infrastructure together just like it did on the Earth. It's going to take even longer because it's off planet. But I'll show you one, my one extra slide. Um, so you can go today. This is not from 200 years in the future. This is today. You go online, you look up Aurora Space Station. This group of entrepreneurs is seeking um, seed funding to build a space hotel in low Earth orbit. Uh, you click the Reserve Now button. Thousands of people have already done it and have bought their ticket to go in a hotel in low Earth orbit. Okay. They're going to have to feed them. They're going to have to give them something to do. Some of them are going to want to go outside. Hey, I bought my ticket. I'm going outside. OK, get in the spacesuit, get training, right? Uh, some of them are going to have heart attacks. You know, I mean, all the infrastructure you would need for tourism, even, even wilderness has an infrastructure associated with it. You're going to have to have it in space, too. Other questions? 
Okay, this is the book, ladies and gentlemen. This is the book. And as he was saying, at the very end, there are several of these luscious posters that you've seen that literally can be sort of torn out of the book, right? And, you know, framed, put together. But it's all that 30s sort of what retro... Retro kind of, future. Yeah, retro future. <laughs> south of the future uh, at the back of the book. And, um, you know, itineraries and... Um, of what you would do, planet to planet, in much more detail than what Jim could provide in his presentation. So, um, I, any of you who have that really strong visual sense and want to want to feel like this is a possibility, you've got to got to get a copy of this. If I see any of you on the moon some weekend, just remind <laughs> me that you were here tonight. <laughs> we're first okay. here. Yeah. Right. Uh, Jim, thank you so much. Thank you much. so much. Thank you. thank you, everybody.